When people uh, talk about Gandhi's army, we need to remember a lot of things. Sometimes when I teach Gandhi's army, I show a lot of Gandhi's army, and then the guy comes and he stands like this, and I'm over here, and he says, what are you doing now? Boom, boom. So of course you cannot uh, do nothing to somebody that wants to assassinate you. It is very hard to disarming a sniper from uh, 100 yard or something like that. How can you disarm it? You need another way to disarm it. So let's talk about the simple way. And again, the guy come and say, give me your money. The best self-defense is to give him your money. Mostly if you work on a bar, in a bank, in any place else, and the guy say, give me your money, 90% it's even not your money, you're just employee of somebody, so why to be a hero and try to kill yourself? And even if it's your money, it's better to give the money and make a new one than to uh, retry to reborn again, because it's not possible. So when you have a gun, for example, for your head, because most of people, and it's no matter if they hold it like this or like that, that's only from movies. If the guy holds the gun over here and he says, uh, let's say it's not uh, give me the money, I want to shoot you. And take a look that when the gun, even to the center of the head or the up, the more up, it's more easy. But when I say one, Brian will try to shoot me, okay? One. Two. 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 Three. Two. You see that the head is a small target. So when somebody, first when you see the gun, it means the gun don't want to kill you. Second, it's still a bad news because we still have a, a gun to our head. So it's much getting complicated when it's in the middle of your body because now if I try to move, one, boom, you get shot, two, boom, you get shot. Our liver is in the right side. Now we start to also thinking about damage control. If I move the gun this way and the mischarge will be here, I will lose my liver, for example. So, again, now it's getting more complicated how you need to analyze which direction to go and how to go. It could be you want to move the gun this way, but here stand your kid. And many times people, they perform gun disarming, the VAP standing and the guy is doing this and punch the guy, but you're still shooting your VAP man and that's the last thing you want to do. So gun disarming is not a toy. And mostly every gun disarming that you do with this toy, you know, like people do this and, and fight, they still do it. But if you see the barrel is pointing to me, if you do like this, still pointing to you. So you feel, you're dealing with a firearm and a firearm, first of all, it's a mechanism. And very soon we explain a little bit about the mechanism. And one way to disarming a gun is to jam the mechanism. Because when you disarm, when the mechanism jam, it's easy to disarm it now or just to escape because it will take time to clean the jam and it gives you the time either to react by disarming or either to react by running away. When I was in the Israeli army, we used to teach a few gun disarming, police different gun disarming. Many times those gun disarming based on uh, analyze maybe only one style of gun. It, it don't mean that they will work with any kind of gun. So I'm going to analyze a little bit about gun disarming and talk a little bit about uh, things that might be work in one situation, but definitely not in another one. When you do this and you punch the guy, if he fall down on his way down, he will shoot you because the trigger pulled by his own finger. When his weight going down by the gravity, I hold the gun and then the finger. So even you win by punching him and even you almost knock him down, but this might be causing to you. When, uh, for example, I do this first move and I want to punch him, it could be that he immediately move it to his hip. And again, you find yourself over here. So even if I do it fast, it might still kill me and but by even punching him and he fall down, he might take your life. Definitely, if there is a, for example, a situation that we have something in between us and I will try to do it and I'll demo. This gun disarming looks good for movies, but it's getting worse when you are behind the desk or a buffer between me to him. Because when I do this and I try even to punch him and go back, I got to fight with him right now when this point to your head or to your body, you're going to lose. 
even if I'm going to pull the gun and he fight because he don't want it, we will find ourselves getting shot. Now, I don't say that it will not work in any scenario. Many times you could be lucky, but you could see that in those gun disarming, we get a problem. Instead of punching him too fast, when I'm over here, for example, and the gun is pointing to me, if you do this, for example, now, you see, even if you try to shoot, you see my finger block the hammer. So there's no way you will shoot. By putting my finger here, I block it. By do this, I will, for example, put the gun safety. So even if you want to shoot and I let him, he will get nothing. So just by doing this, now if you want to fight, you can fight and clean the magazine and give him back the gun, or, okay? So this is making the old gun disarming completely different. As you see, to do a properly gun disarming, you need to be immediately know which gun he has, the mechanism of the gun. And that's why it's not to train with a simple plastic gun. You need to train with a simulation gun like this one. That is for training. That's why it's marked in red. But it's copy of a real gun and operate on the same. And this is the reason, again, like when I do this, for example, and again, see, I put first my finger, drop the magazine. Now, if there will be, if there will be a discharge bullet because I didn't put the finger on time or something, it's go there and he has nothing anymore ammo in this gun. So it means it's very safe for me from here and now to disarm him. If, for example, we come to a fight, I can go and do this, and now you can try to shoot me as much as you want. But right now, I just use the mechanism of the gun, for example, for disarming, because I know the gun and immediately I can take it apart or take the mechanism apart or jam the gun. And many times when people show gun disarming, it's a very big risk to do it because when you don't know to do it properly, and I guarantee that if you tell the guy that uh, teaching you gun disarming, do uh, malfunction number one, cleaning. Malfunction number three, it creates a problem. That's why in Kapak we see it again at the triangle structure. When you have to do gun disarming, this is, will be one side. The other side will be gun retention. You have to assume that when you want to disarm it, you want to retain the gun. That's why they fight together. And at the end, you need to be able to know to operate the gun. And why? Because when I take the gun away from him, if, if at all, if I choose the way, it don't mean that I will do a fancy way like that. That was only to demo for you the mechanism of the gun. But if I do a gun disarming, it's mostly under a circumstance of a kidnap. Because I'm imagining I'll give you my money. But if you kidnap me, I will operate and I will take your gun away. And that way, it could be that you have two people or three people, and then you must be immediately know how to shoot. Now, it could be that you will come out and say, wow, this gun disarming is bad. And it's not, it's a great gun disarming. Depend on the situation. You have a toolbox, and in this toolbox, you might have a screwdriver, you might have a hammer, you might have a saw. If you use the wrong tool in the, right, in the wrong time, that's where you're doing the mistake. There's nothing mistake with the gun disarming. This gun disarming will work for you perfectly. If, for example, the guy sit and you sit and it's in a car, for example, and if I'm in a car and the guy put the gun, I say, don't shoot me. Move the gun over here, stick it to his body so it's jammed. And now if I punch him or smack him, can he pull back the gun? He can't because now he's over here. So that's how you judge technique. If you try to teach people martial art by teaching them technique, their technique will all the time fail. If you teach them how to think, how to react by instinct, that's the way to teach martial art. That's why you'll see that Kapak we teach a lot of drills, almost like uh, this is why I love uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Drills, rolling, sparring, analyzing, and explore. And then you find out that it worked for you perfectly in one situation, and completely wrong to another situation. And unfortunately, today people too fast to teach things that it's too fast for them to teach because they never analyze it enough to get into this teaching. We start to talk about gun disarming and when you want to perform it and one of the situations you will have to perform it and when you are an hostage. 
and most of hostage, your hand will be locked. So that's why when you build up technique for gun disarming, you must also see that, for example, if those technique will work in different situations and you have to train for it. So for example, if I want now to do this and punch the guy, can I do it? Is it will be safe for me to fight with him right now? But if I do it like that and I grab, see my fingers, trap him here, and now let's say that even if I, and I still don't do the technique properly, like kicking him here, headbutt him, rip the gun, and I can immediately move six and shoot. So that's how you start to create gun disarming with a analyzing what you need, what's the situation, and how to do it. Okay, let's go back to the gun disarming body language. If you look at me and you put a gun for me and I stand like that, what it say to you? It's like an attitude. If I'm like that, I'm scared. I cooperate. So the body language must not be like, what's that, just a gun. It's, it's a danger tool, that's why from here. Now if the gun go up, you have to slowly bring your hand up, like, don't shoot me. And now if the gun go down, oh, please don't shoot me, you know? So your hand should be near to the gun. If my hands are here, when the gun is here, look how long it will take me to get something if it's up. This is why when the gun is up or down, my hands need to be near to the gun as much as I can. The next thing, you have again like to, uh, let's say that the gun is low, and when you think I'm moving, you say boom, okay? So, I want immediately, you see, to put my finger in, if this is an outside hammer, like in the Beretta, to put my finger here. If there is no, the hammer is inside, it will still work, you will not jam the gun by this way, but there's another way to do it. But from here, I put the L, if you see the L shape, I put one here, and the second, and come over here. So the first thing I want to do, I want to shoot my body, and if you see, pull him to take him out of balance. That's the first move I want to do it. And again, before you pull the trigger, ready? Look. And now from here, you can start to do the gun disarming. And that's the basic to start, that you can move from here to the side, sound like in boxing, tie boxing, like to get the angle, to be an angle fighter, than a straight fighter. So when Brian go with the gun and he try to shoot, this will be the first move. And by smacking and grabbing, and from here, if I, for example, want to smack him or kick him, that's beautiful. Now, even when you want to punch him, this will create extension. This will create extension to this direction. The direction that give me more safe to work. That's why if you want to smack him, you don't want to smack the head, I don't want to smack him here and then headbutt him. Because the gun come here, he's going down, then you headbutt him. And from here, when you headbutt him, you're already coming and bring the gun to him and take him all the way down or either take just the gun or we will saw another way of control from here. The next situation, again, the guy put you on your knees. It's like a assassinating style. And he said to you, hasta la vista, baby. You know that he's not demanding money or anything that you can uh, give him and get free from the situation. You must react. So again, what we try to do, we try to create two contacts uh, two points of contact. If I do only this and you pull back, you find yourself plus to deal with his knees. So that's why, first of all, is to take control on the weapon. And to get a good control on the weapon is first of all, to be able to control two points. So I do this, and if you see, I take him immediately out of balance, a little bit down. The reason, now can you knee? It's very hard on him. If I do it only like that, he can knee or kick you back, and then you'll get the problem. So watch out for the finger. First reaction. Second, I pull him with me, and when he come to the ground, I kick his face or his neck in this way. Very bad, 
I do it slowly. I need Brian more. Pop the gun away from him. Create the distance, and now I can go and play with the gun. And the rhythm, let's go it very slow. Put the finger in and look what happens. When I'm over here, first is this. Can you see? It'll give me the gun just by this gun. You feel? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you see, when I get to the gun disarming, my first approach is here. So I get already a uh, finger lock over here. So when I'm over here, don't shoot me. I just tuck almost like that on the gun. Jam the gun over here. I have lock here, and I'll have a lock on the finger. You feel it? Yep. So now I can rotate the gun to his face. I can pull him to me and give him a straight kick when I do it. And shoot. If the gun didn't jam. If it jam, I have to take my time, clean the jam, put back, load, and shoot. And if you see, I don't need even to look to him because I just do a point shooting to him. If this is a good way, no. Because basically I don't want to stay on the ground. So when the guy come over here, put your finger in please, slowly. You want to do this, take him out, pull him down. Knees face, kick him. And now I'm over here to shoot. Or if I have a malfunction, look how long it will take him to get up, come back to me when I already have the time to operate the gun, clean the malfunction and shoot him or if I have another enemy in the situation. When the guy, for example, hold the gun for you in the back, first thing you have to do is to look because uh, it could be his finger and the gun return back. So I can see it. And that's when you have to judge your student all the time, put the finger and put the gun back. And now I say, put it back the gun. Okay, so many times people are not aware that they really have a gun. My first thing is to look. Something touch your back, you don't immediately think it's a gun. It could be an umbrella. So when I'm over here, I look. I try also to see what gun he has. There will be different way, maybe for revolver to deal with than with a slide gun. That's why the first thing I look. Now, let's say that now I'm looking for the timing. It's not like a, we're standing here, you ready? I'm going to disarm you. We wait. Maybe tell me let's move to the other room because I'm a hostage, maybe try to walk me somewhere. So I have all the time in the world to wait to what we call a timing. And many times you'll see when people rotate, they rotate this direction and mostly they try to elbow because it looks very good and the main problem, look what happened. You come immediately also to his punch, to his strong side. I will try to prevent this gun disarming mostly because I immediately, when I turn here, even when you're surprised and whatever, some people have a good reflex and you might find yourself in a problem. I don't mean that in several situations, I will not do gun disarming like that. You come here, Pip. It depends on the situation. I just talk about this gun disarming, what's the problematic, and we try to improve it. So from this gun disarming, many times you'll see that people go to the elbow when they do it. And the problem is that many times I took a few elbows in my face and you don't knock down so fast. People that fight don't knock out from one elbow. You need to be very lucky punch for that. What happened now is do you see you can move the, the wrist you don't have any control on the gun when we fight. Even when you do this, if you push me now with his other hand and pull the gun, pull and push, you'll stay without the gun. So even if you do it in a nice way and he do the same thing to retain the gun, but you see what happened? You might find yourself. So to do it this way or any way with a weapon, you must make sure that you have control and now if I want like second point, second point, second point, second point, second point. That's how you start again to judge. Do we have the second point or do we have only one point when we do the gun disarming? Remember also I told you about the liver. When I wrote it here, if there will be a discharge, it's go to my liver. Because we talk still about damage control. If I go here, I will be hurt but I'll be hurt on this side, mostly. 
That's why when I rotate to his outside, I will not have to deal with this hand. Also, all I need to do is to salute and I trap the hand. So it's very easy, mostly when you have more than one gun disarming to do this and here. If I want to take him down, it's no matter how, it's no matter if now I go like elbow down, elbow up, I will be immediately disarming him any direction that I want to have the gun. And that's why if I have a chance to rotate to this side, I will prefer prefer this side. It's much more difficult for him to retain the gun and better control for me for anything that I will improvise later on. And if you see, that's not a gun disarming. I just improvise about him because he's a tall guy, I'm, I'm smaller. That technique worked for me. If it was different, I would not recommend you to try to get under me to find a different one. But many times when you're a small guy, you can rotate. The problem is that big frame has a lot of power. Small frame like me don't. We need to use a lot of technique, body move. And that's why I will go to the outside. I don't need to deal with this hand. And I have a lot of things that I can go from the outside as a gun disarming later. As you remember, we have three dimension. We talk a little bit about the front, a little bit about the back. Let's a little bit see the, the side. Before we go to the side, I want to show you very old the uh, gun disarming that was used in uh, some counter-terror uh, units in Israel many years ago. And again, that gun disarming is problematic. We we'll talk a little bit about the problems with this gun disarming, but again, what we can study from it. The, 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 the way is not to come and bash this gun disarming is bad. It's, okay, what's wrong with this gun disarming? And let's evolve it. Kapap is a develop or progressive system. The, the main idea why we analyze system is we don't want to study it because. We want to really find the reason why and if there is a better way to do it, we upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. I don't want to do gun disarming because somebody did it in 1960 or 1940, if I can find and analyze and find a better way. <coughs> there was an old way to do, when you think I'm moving, you say boom. So that's the old way to do gun disarming. It's a risk, I'll do it slow. I don't recommend you to do it unless you have to. Like the guy says, hasta la vista, it's good in a few situations, and if you do it properly, you have to do it with a body move so you don't get shot. But if the guy holds tight to the gun and you do it, you might stuck and you cannot do it. And if you see, I put the two points very fast. And my problem is either the gun stay in his hand or either the gun drop on the floor and if he's stronger than you, you have not to fight for the gun, which you don't want. You want the gun in your hand. Gun disarming should be like a magic now, I'm the boss. If you don't do it as a magician and very quick, the gun is here, I don't care how strong you are. That's stronger than any man. And that's why when you move the bed exercise to a gun disarming from the side, and when I used to be in the police academy, we used to teach it this way. Here, and from here we came with this finger and get in here. And the main problem, with this gun disarming, it's not good. We will talk later. But the Israeli Police Academy, we used to teach it. Why? They have a lot of politics. I don't get into politics. I talk and analyze technique, and I don't care if the best Israeli commando do it or the worst uh, unit in the world. I talk only about the technique, what's wrong with them, and analyze and upgrade. So when I do this, first of all, I want to take him far, uh, farther. That way I can go like for uh, hand locks, hand locks. It gives me a lot of opportunities. If he stand like this, he can fight back. If he stand like this, he can't. He's in a balanced displacement. That's why I don't want to stand him. I want to take him out of balance. So the next move when he's out of balance is just like the same thing to put, this is the first point, to put the second point in a very quick way and you have the gun in your hand. Once it's in your hand, you retain it back that way, not this way, that way. So if he try to pull it from you, you have to take it with him. And then I can fight with him, clean him, 
when we talk about gun retention. And that's a proper way. Also, remember that every gun has injection window, that when you shoot from here, it's okay. But when you are lefty, you just jamming your gun on your shirt. Because the injection shell, when it's come and hit your shell, it's stuck here and it will jam your gun. So if you do it this way, it's much more safe than to do it this way from the jamming point. Plus from the retain of the gun. So the way that I use is almost the same like I did this way, but this time, and it works also if you uh, in airplane or you sit here and the guy walk in the alley or in a bus, just like that. And the gun is over here. What I do, I smack the ulnar nerve. If you see, it's not like this, it's like this. I give an angle like this. Remember the triangle? So this time it's this way. And I take this and I smack the, you see like my angle for him is like a triangle. And that's why from here, I'll smack the ulna nerve that you can feel it if you push something here, you will feel the ulna nerve. I smack also the tendon because I do it very quick. You see, I smack the tendon. And on the same time, I immediately create the second point and take it out. If you do it root, your hand will be numb a little bit. And mostly, I'll not do it so soft and immediately to create the distance to take the gun away. That's, for example, for gun disarming from the side. We talk about problems. When you do it from here, and I have only one finger, I have only one finger to fight with, the, with him. And I'll explain it in a next demo. Remember I told you this is one, this is two, and this is wrong. How many fingers do you see here? You see only my thumb. Let's say that now when I fight with him, there was a mischarge, he shoot, so, the shell jump out. I didn't jam it. The shell can jump out from the window because I hold the barrel. Because for example, with this gun, the P92 Beretta, I hold the barrel. I don't hold the, the, the chamber uh, window. So what happened is like, when I'm over here, there was a discharge. The gun load and you bullet we still under the fight. It's not mean that only you can fight him or take the gun. When you do this, you smack my face, smack. And now what you face? A gun that can be shoot. Or under the struggle now, he can back the gun and shoot. And you got a bullet to your body. Let's do it differently. This time, Brian moved my hand and he come first like this way. So like, if we fight, my first gun retention, I'm not talking about smack, my first gun retention is to put my two points on the gun, because he have already two points, but his point is weak. So immediately I do this, he will lose. But if he come this way, first you remember, he can jam the hammer, see? So that's why first move is almost the last move, because if you jump the hammer now, you, it's much more safe for you to disarm it than like this way. That how can he jam my hammer now? Now if I power, what happens if I'm a small frame? If I'm like my wife, how can my, my wife can fight with one finger? But when it's here, push back when I do it, push, push to my body, he will win. Of course we can add all of those nonsense, but and, and we will in under, under the fight. But stop making it like a movie and everything is like That will not save your life. That's a choreographic and nothing more. If you want really to judge yourself, if you, you have to fight. I can tell Brian to try to shoot me at any time and I will disarm him and show you that he can fight as much as he want for the gun. And the gun will be in my hand. So I have a gun in my front and I have a gun in my, in my side. And right now, just as I analyze, of course there could be both here. It could be also that one will have uh, with the left and one with the right. And we have all of those games with light, without light. After I've been pepper spray, I have to fill it and just by, or, or by uh, lighting my eyes and then to perform the gun disarming under hard circumstance. 
Right now, we just taught to analyze how to teach Ganda Sarmen slowly, not to go to the advanced level. So the, the next move, I have two guns pointing to me, one to my side up, one to my front down. And the first thing I have to do, I will have to lock it one end a little bit up, one end like, and please don't shoot me, please don't shoot me. And the next way, I have to react like 10 times before they will uh, react like one. And if you see, if there will be a discharge, it will go to their body. So right now you can see that I don't need to use sight. I use a point shooting again. And that's why it's very important when you study uh, gun defense to use point shooting. That's the best system for close distance, like 21 feet. Over 21 feet, yes, put your sights. Before 21 feet, if you put sights, mostly uh, you're getting to a problem, mostly if it's a knife. And later on, we will talk about the Tuller rule or the 21 feet rule. So, for example, I did it one and you try to say boom when I move. <laughs> Good. So this is two and now three. So you go like for 10. And when you have 10 of 10, they, they shot themselves. And take a look, it's not like this, it's this. And also, you have to bring them close and parallel. Don't hold the gun like this, parallel. This is why you have to do it only 5,000 times. Like one, two. And you will see that it looks very simple when I do it. When you try to do it at home, you'll see that it's not so simple. Do it 5,000 times. Bring the L shape here, bring the L shape here, and step forward when you do it. Now, if you, I want to dis disarming them, I could summon disarming. That's a technique. But the technique built up by a principle, and I put two points. So for example, for Martin, and I show it for example, one, one gun, when uh, Martin come a little bit to my side so they can see this way. <laughs> okay, so when I do this, I parallel the gun. I have only one point. He will immediately try to return. That's why what I do, once I do this, I take my wrist in this motion to create the second point. And then you can smack him, for example, to create the, the effect that it will be disoriented to take the first gun. The second gun, it was here. I bring it here. And again, I will have to create a second point. So him here, put the finger in. This finger is in. I trap the finger. And look, I bring it here. If I bring it up, it will even stop to you. So of course, when you do this, oh, and now you can also take him on Martin. So I shield both of, both of my enemy in one place so I can deal with both of enemies. This is example for gun disarming simple drill. It's still not a technique. Another drill, I have a gun here and I have a gun in my back. So I will do, please don't shoot me. I verify that both of them have a gun. I cooperate, wait for my timing. When you think I'm moving, you say boom, go, go. Good. You see how I took one gun? Can be here. That's the, big, the biggest problem, my back. Come in here, take him here, and have the gun. That's still not a technique. I just improvised to show you a basic drill and try to put the two guns. And now you do this drill 5,000 times. Better if you do 10,000, but 5,000 is the minimum. Like two points of contact are minimum. One, two, three. Once you start to do it, to do not show anybody any body reaction, like you have to be like, when you think I'm moving, you say, boom, okay, one, two. See, out, lock, lock. And you have the two guns. And that's basic idea to start to disarming guns, two guns, three guns, one gun here, one gun here. Then you go for shotguns and remember, both, many people talk about uh, uh, line of fire. There's no line of fire. There's a field of fire. When I move gun here, I'm not on the wrist, but my kid or my VIP protection friend, wife, they stand here. If it's your boss in work, it's okay. You can put the field of fire for him. <laughs> but normally, we want to keep the safe for our family. When I do this, it's quite a problem. But I know only this gun disarming now. 
That's wrong. That's why you have to be able to disarm in any direction to any direction. Because if I have a problem to transition the field of fire from here to here, it creates a problem. When I transition the gun down, if there will be a discharge, because this is a mat, the bullet will stay down. But if you are in a wood house, and mostly in California it's a wood house for example, and the bullet might go down to my kid bedroom, don't do it, take it up. So if it's go out to the air, it's much better. If you live in a country that it's a concrete or you find yourself in a concrete or cement like in a parking lot and you do this, the ricochet might come to your face or to another person. That's why you have to control also the field of fire, not only to control the gun. It's like you want to control the head of the snake and the, the poison, the bullet will not go out. One of the main features that weapon retention, uh, Kapap uses a lot of uh, research during the process of finding the best system or finding the most appropriate system for the common uh, person on the street. We do, did a lot of research and we, uh, one of the manual books that we uh, came up with was in the uh, state of uh, New York. Uh, it's a very simple uh, retention system that is used in the uh, uh, police academies. A lot of police academies now start to develop their own curriculum. And we found this uh, specific manual book very beneficial for our purpose because it's a very simple, uh, straightforward uh, manual book. And from this uh, manual book, we took uh, the system that is called SPEC. Uh, and I will go in uh, uh, to demo what is the SPEC. And for the usual person that is carrying a handgun or for self-defense, usually he carries it on his waistband. Uh, most of the time it's gonna be concealed and uh, the concealment uh, everybody has his own uh, uh, preference for concealment uh, and carry options. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the most common uh, carry condition when the gun is exposed. Uh, basically it's more for police officers and security guards which are carrying the handgun. Uh, most of the cases that you will see uh, problems with, uh, with the uh, handguns is the cases that the, the, the person that is carrying the handgun is gun shot by his own handgun. And this is why we need to also evaluate a lot of uh, uh, principles which start even with the dress code. Dress code can be very problematic if you don't know uh, how to start to begin with to plan where you put your tools around you. One of the main tools of uh, uh, security uh, personnel or police officers is the handgun. And when the handgun is uh, uh, being uh, carried away in an uh, unsecured uh, uh, holster or an inappropriate uh, uh, way, it can be uh, used against you and therefore we want to start with the, the feature of uh, dress code. When I start talking about the dress code, I'm talking about uh, a proper uh, carry condition and at, for this case we're, we're going to do a, a, a demo with the most common uh, uh, holster which is an exposed holster or a pancake holster which has another feature that locks over uh, the hammer. This feature here is a thumb brake uh, uh, um, safety, which beyond the carrying or, or holding the handgun itself has another strap which can be, uh, which will secure the handgun inside the holster. It will need another feature to break the, the, the strap with my thumb or with, in another way just to pull the handgun out. So this is the first safety feature that we're talking about. Okay, after we spoke about the first safety feature, uh, which is the uh, level of s uh, security on that holster, uh, we're gonna go for the actual uh, retention or the actual system of retention that we call SPEC. SPEC stands for S for secure, P for position, uh, E for uh, effect release, and C for uh, create distance. When we're talking about the secure, the S that stands for secure in SPEC, we're gonna talk about the approach of uh, how a person needs to uh, eventually, uh, how, how, how you first of all engage or what is your first action when uh, things go south. And most of the problem starts when somebody's carrying his handgun and the perpetrator or the opponent or the whatever you wanna call it or the criminal wants to use your own handgun and to take it away from you. So the first action will be uh, uh, securing your handgun inside the holster. So this is the S. I will ask uh, Brian 
to reach for my handgun and just touch it. Now immediately as a police officer or a person that carries a handgun, my first action is to have two points of contact securing my handgun and preventing from Brian to pull this handgun out. Uh, uh, Brian's action will be uh, to try to take the handgun out. In order to do that, he'll need to pull the handgun out in an elevation type of uh, movement. My movement will be to counter that and secure it and to start to push my handgun back in the holster. So this is the secure point. And if uh, we will turn so the camera will see the exact angle, we'll stand here and any type of approach from Brian to my holster, my first reaction will be two hands on a handgun and securing a handgun inside the holster. Now, if, even if Brian had the opportunity to reach and start to put the hand, the hand over the handgun, again, I'm touching my handgun over this and I'm pushing it towards my, uh, inside my holster. We spoke about the S, which is the secure. Now I'm gonna talk about the P. Uh, the P is the, the position. The position here is very crucial to uh, the entire technique itself or the entire system, because this will create the next uh, uh, ground for the next effect. It's a one continuous move. And when we do the spec, you have to understand that it's a building block for uh, the other uh, uh, techniques that will follow. So basic uh, uh, weapon retention has to start with first the secure, which is the first aspect that we spoke about. And this is the, uh, the first uh, move that we do in order to secure, to, to prevent from the weapon to come outside from your holster. When it's coming outside from your holster, it's a different ball game. Now you're fighting in order to keep that uh, weapon inside the holster. After Brian has reached and touched my handgun and I secured, okay, the next thing we'll do is to pull away or to lower my uh, center of gravity and to position myself in a way that he's not uh, in the uh, he's not on the top of the game here, and I have the still the advantage to uh, be in the fight. So what I'm going to do next. After I touch the weapon, I'm gonna lower my silhouette and take my uh, uh, center of gravity down. This will prevent from Brian, again, to be in the fight. Okay, after we spoke about secure and position, next effect will be to uh, effect the release. Effect release, that means that I need to uh, create another point in order to break the release from Brian's hold and from my uh, uh, holster or my handgun. And I will do that after I did the secure the position, and now will come the blow that will take the uh, hand and will separate it from up to down in a one continuous move. After we spoke about the effect release and uh, now the release is broken, we need to create as distance, as much distance as we can because we cannot stay in the fight zone when Brian is too close to me because now I know his intention is to take my handgun or to fight for my handgun and now I'm compromising my own security or my own safety if I'm losing my handgun to the perpetrator. So uh, after I, I finish the cycle of effecting the release and I have uh, uh, Brian in this position, okay, I broke the release, okay, and now I'm doing everything that I can in order to create a distance. From here, I control the subject much better in order to uh, 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 give him any order to continue or to stop. And from this point on, verbally I command him to stop and therefore we go for the escalation of force. Okay, let's go back into uh, weapons, uh, into some arm techniques. One of the basic, most fundamental uh, weapons out there is a knife. It's everywhere in the world they used it ever since man was out there. A cutting tool. Uh, makes a lot of damage. I think it's a, by a lot of martial artists is very underestimated and I think that's the most dangerous tool, especially in close close quarters in a range like this if I had to get in a, in a life-threatening conflict with somebody I would rather have a knife than, than a gun <clears throat> can do much more damage um, there's not knives out there today serrated blade um, all typical types of um, mean looking blades are tactically designed to hurt and maim and stuff like that there's a lot of good companies out there uh, knife is just a vicious tool in the, in the right hands, even in un, unskilled hands, it's still vicious and dangerous because it doesn't take much to do this or do this and it's still going to do damage, although you train all your life in a, by in a skillful hand, it's going to be very, very uh, devastating. Okay, so let's review real quick the angles of attack that you've probably seen in the 
previous episode, you're probably going to be familiar with either Kapop DVDs or um, uh, some other Filipino martial arts that we go by. We took integrated only the best uh, parts of Filipino martial arts that is relevant to us from different styles. Uh, Kali Arnis, um, a lot of a lot of it was influenced from uh, CSSD Elmar um, Arnis. Um, let's go quick through the through the angles, and then we're gonna go over some uh, principles. Okay, so let's just start by angles of attack. I'm standing here, knife outside. Remember, knife versus knife. Always want to have the knife outside. I think of like kind of like a fencing match. Okay, you don't want to have your hand outside if you're fighting an, another guy that's got a um, a, a blade. In his hand because everything is everything outside is going to be a target and will get cut okay so you're closed behind the knife you're closing you're not opening um, let me just go through real quick the angles of attack so we can see from here <clears throat> I got the one coming from upper di diagonal to bottom two back in upper diagonal to bottom we got three horizontal slash we got four backhand horizontal slash left, slash left left to right, and we got the stab. Later on, of course, we got we got six and seven, and we got the twelves and all the angles. We're just going to focus on the basic slash scenario. Somebody that's on the street most likely is going to encounter um, not so much with the fancy ones, but even though with the fancy ones or the more advanced one, not just necessarily fancy, uh, we're also going to talk about because basically. What we're trying to do is narrow it down and break it down so you're going to have as minimal um, tools to stop multiple attacks. Okay, let's go back talk about uh, some uh, techniques and uh, wrong techniques. Most Pretty much most commonly used mistakes and uh, techniques you've probably seen in many other Israeli martial arts uh, you might be familiar with. Uh, we're going to show the most common techniques and their mistakes, why it doesn't work and what's what is the danger of applying that technique that mainly the danger is not for your attacker it's for yourself mainly so how to avoid a technique or how to better yourself but what i'm trying to show you here is how common sense kicks in the technique and or to that defense that this one kind of is lacking common sense okay so brian is actually uh gonna attack me with the common uh, upper stab. <laughs> Familiar with that? Okay. Lower stab. <laughs> Familiar. I'm sure you've seen it before. Okay, so let's let's kind of break it down and see what's wrong with it. I know it looks really cool and everything, but let's let's put some common sense behind and see what's what's uh, what can go very very wrong and very very fail. Okay, so <clears throat> let's do it first time and, and then we're gonna break it, okay? Brian thinks that he's got a longer reach that can rely on that. Yeah, maybe if we're in a boxing match, this jab is probably definitely gonna reach me before I'm gonna reach him, okay? But it's not a boxing match. And I got this. It's a four inch blade, trainer blade, but in real life, it's gonna cut like, like butter. Okay, strip all the way to the bones. You can go see more proof uh, DVDs. You can see how much damage it does to soft tissue if you don't, don't take my word for it. But <clears throat> the minute let's break it down, I was in a little slower motion. The minute he did that, look where my knife is. Even if he didn't do anything, don't forget, I still got this hand up. I'm not gonna just attack him like this, okay? This is not some choreography of, of a movie. I'm gonna have both my hands up. We're still in a fight, if, even if I don't know what I'm doing. From here, boom. I might just slide down along his hand. I'm not even planning on doing that. Okay, slide down his hand line and reach all the way to his rib cage or here, even worse, the artery that goes in the armpit. Now, let's say I've got a little bit of skill or a little bit know what I'm doing here. The minute he does that, okay, I'm planning on doing that. Get that hand here, get out of the way, stab from here, slash the belly, stab from above, get him in a tight clincher spin. And it's all, it's all from here. Another variation, another mistake that can happen. I set him up. This is a, from a little bit more advanced. I set him up for that kind of like telegraphing. It's kind of telegraphing your right hand, coming with the left, left hook to the body. Same idea for a little bit more advanced. <clears throat> Same thing, do slower. Okay, 
I set him up with this, look what happened. And my blade up, soon as I've seen this, and don't forget, the most common mistakes, never emphasize a blocking with the darker part of your hand, the hairy part of your hand, your arm, your forearm, is always blocking. I never ever seen proper uh, block with the darker part, maybe in the Filipino martial arts definitely know how to block it properly. But in uh, those commonly mistake systems, always, always the softer part, the part with all the arteries, with all the, the nerves running down here. So from here, I set them up. If you cannot see, look close, you're gonna be really slow now from here. I set them up and look what I'm doing, changing my mind the last minute. And I'm gonna come with almost like a overhand slash goes all the way inside. And of course, from here, I'm gonna add, get out of the way and get a nice stab with her on the inside, stealing a center line from here. But that alone here, that's a five finisher right here, that slash. Okay, so um, another variation I can do, I can set him up. Um, also known as a trapping range, Filipino martial art guys, you're gonna be familiar with gunting, uh, the trapping the, uh, the trapping techniques. From here, boom, look what I'm doing, I'm just hooking him right here. I had a double edge, even, even better, but still nonetheless. From here, cut the, cut the biceps right here and work my way from the top. Cut the biceps, parry, slash into the neck, do my, do my thing here. Another variation with the gun thing from here, trap, come from the side, look what I'm doing, power assisted, and just squeeze right in, squeeze the knife into the gut. There's a lot of setups, that's more in the skill guy, but even you see a guy that's going nuts just by doing this, uh, coming inside, in, right into the rib cage out of panic or uh, um, out of lack of experience. I'm going to talk about a defense that's very popular out there from a very uh, typical stab that we used to call the Middle Eastern stab uh, just because of the way it was commonly performed and um, commonly people got attacked with that stab. It looks like this pretty much from here and from the bottom to top and guts out either blade up or blade down. Uh, most of them use blade up just for the continuous motion to create more upper damage to the torso and the midsection area. Let's see what's the problem with this attack. Juan is going to perform the defense. Looks familiar? Very impressive. Let's see what, let's see that the damages and the mistakes that can happen in, by performing this technique. Let's break it down a little bit. From here, I come, whether my blade, my blade is currently gonna be down, I'm gonna show you why. From here, again, I, you see how I deflect that? I got my hand up, move maybe a little bit of a <clears throat> head motion from here. Like I said, if you get punched in the head, most likely what's gonna happen, he's gonna break his knuckles. I don't see too many people go down with a head punch. From here, I still got the target here. You can see what's gonna happen if I am sliding it all the way up. Oh, it's gonna ride all the way to the armpit right here and stab. If I know a little bit of what I'm doing here and I'm oriented with that from here, all I gotta do is trap the hand from the inside. I'm sure every wrestler know that move. Just trap the arm from the inside, pull and push. Same principle we talked about before. And there goes the femoral artery right here. And I've got the complete opening of the back, stab, and you know the rest, okay? Another variation, that's blade down, okay? Whether you're carrying a, a, a straight, a single edge or a double edge, it, it doesn't matter because then you can work both ways. Sometimes it's gonna be for your benefit, but let's work this time, blade up. From here, look what happens. As he does that, does that I deflect and I pull in. You see how he's exposed here? Remember we, we talked about fight finishers? This is a fight finisher. He cannot afford to take a cut from here. Remember, put, take in, take on away. I'm not gonna be standing here Oh, very good. From here, as soon as I feel that, especially if my blade is up, look what happens instinctively as he punched me. Oh, I'm still gonna take, take it on the way out even if I don't know anything better. Just because I'm clumsy or just because I got hit in the face. From here, the punch pulled back. Now, I hope everybody can see here when I'm actually slicing completely by, by an instinct here, cutting, cutting it down. Okay, so, we saw that the most commonly mistake from here, there's so many options I can do from here. I can trap, I can set up and slice. I can trap, come from above, come from under, 
there's a lot of options. Same here for, for the bottom ones. I can come here, I can trap, I can slice, and I can keep on going. Okay, that's that's gonna create a lot of um, a lot of problems. Whoever, uh, I mean, for those of you who never got exposed to like knife cultures or Filipino martial arts in general, go train. We encourage people to go and train and get the orientation of the blade arts and how dangerous a blade is, and then challenge uh, those techniques if you disagree with them. It's your right, but you can have, you always have the option of going and exploring and hopefully you're gonna stay safe. Okay, just uh, to kind of sum up the, the knife, this uh, edge weapon uh, techniques here in the little segment, uh, I'm just gonna show you different variations of knife that are now is commonly out there. Um, knife that has been out there ever since the 10th century, but never exposed to the West uh, till previous years. I'm talking about the Karambit, it's a cold steel Karambit. Uh, another thing that we can also re uh, talk about this knife, and uh, it's one of my favorite one. one of the reasons it's really very difficult to disarm. You can see I got a ring here, so even for a for forward slash, a forward grip I mean, or for a reverse grip, <clears throat> I can still utilize it. It's going to be extremely hard to, to uh, disarm. Even if I fall on the ground, the knife is still in my hand. You can also see by the curved blade, the original blades were actually double, but it doesn't matter. This blade is extremely razor sharp, made by cold steel. Uh, you can stab. We're going to talk about stabbing areas, vital point. And this knife is very dangerous when it comes to, to disarm. You cannot do all those tricks and hitting the hand. It just goes out the window just because of the simple fact it's got a ring on it. Okay, this uh, going back to Karambit, uh, I got a, a Steve Tarani trainer here from Aluminum Trainer. It's safe to train with, but still you can see that it mimics the same same ideas. The thing with the Karambit, if you know how to use it, you got extended grips, you got you can use it in a forward grip, uh, putting it through your pinky, or in a reverse grip, which I prefer personally, just because even if you don't know anything about anything, you can still use your utilize your um, your boxing technique, and as opposed to holding a straight blade, it's gonna go. Um, not uh, right before your knuckle line. Actually, this you can see how far it is goes past your knuckle line. So the first thing is going to contact is actually going to be the tip of the karambit. Okay, you can see from here. You can see from this angle, a straight right, a right hook, right to the body. Which whichever um, attack you're going to do with that, it's, it's, it's going to work even if you don't, don't know anything from from nothing. Um, if you're a little bit skilled, you can actually use it to slash from here and twirl around and come back and rip. So one, two, and rip, get inside and out. Um, Karambit is very good as a, as a trapping point. You can trap the arm, work your triangles from here. One, two, three. You can work the same thing on the rib cage from here, disengage. You can work the same from, from the groin, all those body triangles that we worked on. Remember when we talked about working angles? Triangle, 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 okay? One, two, three. One, two, three. Rib cage. Gut. One, two, three. Triangles of the body, vital point. Target those on one lethal point. For example, I got an attacker. <laughs> From here, I can deflect it and go straight to the joint, demobilizing the joint. He's still gonna live. I'm gonna target joints, not arteries or anything. Of course, they always have the risk of puncturing by mistakes, but from here, it's like getting shot tactically. You shoot the hip. There's a very common point of sh in shooting to disable the guy from walking. Same idea from here. You can come, I deflect from here, boom, punch it, and I just walk, walk away, run away, go to the police, post conflict, the whole thing. Um, very good trapping tool. As far as uh, disarming, very, very hard. Um, very nice, very effective as for trapping. He has uh, grab my shirt. I can always trap from here. Go down the hand to lay down. It's very lethal, yet non-lethal. Depends on your variation and your skill level. Plus, don't forget that little heat ring here. You can always boom right inside, like a, kind of like a knuckle duster, brass knuckle variation of it. Okay, so you got an impact tool here. Even if you hit that here in the chest cavity, it's gonna hurt. Mouth. Um, even if, if that is not a double edge, the karambit, the live karambit I showed before, you can always smack with it as, a, as an impact tool. Smack it and go back your defense position just to show you a different variation a different tool give you a different mindset a different respect for the blade that is going to be very very hard to disarm you don't um think it's uh you think it's impossible 
um, that anything like this can reach you, I think you got another thing coming. So keep that in mind. There's different blades, different systems. We still stick to the basic principles we saw here. Just something to think about. Hello, my name is Guru Roger Agbulos. I am a student, original student of the late Puno Guru Edgar Soliti of Lameco Escrima International, a Filipino combative arts. And I'm here to share with you some common principles of Filipino martial arts as it is with Kapap. So this is my version. All right, at, the, at this point, uh, we're gonna reintroduce again the angles of attack. And that's gonna be uh, seven strikes, seven angles. And that's, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is actually uh, targeting the left temple. If it is extreme close quarter, it is the left temple. And that's the strike number one. Angle number two is on the uh, elbow, the right elbow of the opponent. That's angle number three is on the left elbow of the opponent. And angle number four is on the right temple. Angle number five is a truss. Angle number six is another truss, which is the uh, solar plexus. And seven is the truss on the heart. So if he's gonna go feed me with the seven angles, what it is is strike number one it goes on the left temple. Right is on the shoulder, I mean the elbow, the right elbow. Left is on my left elbow. Number four is on my right temple. Number five, five, six, seven is a thrust, which is the, the stomach. Number six is on the solar plexus. Number seven is on the heart, okay? But that's on extreme or medium to close range. It can also uh, address via on the range of long range. Because if he goes with the seven angles, he's gonna go strike the weapon hand of the opponent, and that's uh, addressing it on the long range. So if I feed him, strike number one, see? Yeah. Strike number two on the long range, he's hitting my weapon hand. In the Filipino martial arts, and this, which is also common on other martial arts, they call it uh, defanging the snake. So when I feed him number five, he's gonna go on an outside position because of the linear attack that goes with the thrust. There you go. Again, outside position, go back. And then the inside position, back. Inside position one more time, back. So if I'm gonna go thrust from the six, which is targeting the solar plexus, he's gonna go angle as well. And back, six, back. And then sub seven, which is the heart, is gonna go angle this way. Back. The reason why you have to move away from the center line when you are uh, when when the when the feeder gives you a a thrusting motion is because in reality a thrust goes with the movement of the body, which is a charge. He goes like that. Nobody will give you a charge in this nature. It is always a charge. So it's a forward motion. So you have to address that by moving on the side. So outside position, back, inside position. My inside position, back. And on the six, outside position, back. Seven, good. On the first progression of this uh, workout, what we're gonna do is, uh, again, review the simple uh, counter to a knife attack. So regardless of angle, what we're trying to um, introduce here is the bugsack, what we call a drop or a cut, which is a uh, knife cut, just going down, simply. So this, if uh, Uri is gonna feed me, I'm gonna go move out because I have to be on a safe zone. Because if I don't, I'm gonna go cut his weapon hand, he is also gonna cut me. So I have to maintain that distance, see? Again, don't overextend. And number two, back. Number three, back. Four, back. Five, I'm gonna go outside, back. Outside, inside position, back. And then number six, thrust here, back. Seven, thrust, heart, and back. Now at this point, 
since we have introduced the seven angles, what we're going to do is uh, add another element of my cut or my 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 uh, slash with a follow up of a thrust, because there is that verbiage in the Filipino mar martial arts but when there's a slash, when there's a thrust, there's a slash. So when there's a cut, there's always a follow up of a thrust. So if it's gonna feed one, I cut the weapon hand, and I move out, and then I follow, okay, again. Without the motion first, the principle is this, and I follow up. Number two, number two, there you go. Again, one guard. And then I follow, okay, number three. Four. Five, outside position. Follow up. Cut. Again. Inside position. Yeah, one more time. Again, outside, inside position. Six. There you go. Six. And move out. At the same time, defang the snake. Follow up. Again. Move up. And then seven. Okay. Again. So, now we have addressed uh, the seven angles with the technique of cut and thrust. Cut and thrust. Cut and thrust. Because you got to complete the story here. Because the guy is not going to give you a chance. You know, he's got to either take you out, so you don't want that, you don't want to be in that situation. That's why we're training ourselves to do certain follow-ups, regardless of angle. Strike one, see, we follow up, okay, two, follow up, okay. So we're going to do, to, we're going to go add another element here, because it's a training. What we're going to do is also have Uri practice the motion of also moving back, and practicing his parry hand or his alive hand. So when he does feed me, see, I go follow up, he's gonna go parry, nice. And also practice taking that weapon to a ready position like that, which is what we call the always, you should always be in a trigger ready position all the time because there is no second chances here. So this is good muscle memory to always retain good foundation in our in our form. So feed number one, number two, number three, nice, four, very good, five, outside position, follow up, parry, another five, parry, six, move out, parry, nice, seven, Nice, wow. very good. At this point, I will now introduce also the other footwork. What we did so far from this, from at this level, is the footwork of a shuffle, forward and backward, forward and backward. Same thing with Uri. When I go forward, it does the same. Backward, forward. That is the shuffle. We call that in Filipino martial arts the caballero footwork, because if you don't move, you are exposed to my to my, my, my weapon, which is a threat. Likewise, I expose myself here as well. That's why in this principle, you are to maintain proximity. That's called the dance, sayaw. All right, so at this point, if I'm gonna go his feet, so you look at what he's gonna do, he's gonna go step up, maintain the range. Two. Four, I'm gonna do a little bit of half beat. Okay, now we're gonna do a little bit of uh, 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 another element to this to this uh, progression, and this is my parry to his parry. So as he feeds, see, I'm gonna go use a different kind of footwork, which is reverse triangle. Once again, feed. Okay, reverse triangle. As I expose myself also to his uh, weapon, I'm gonna go address that as well. So my drill is complete. Feet, nice, see, parry. Mm. Parry, there you go. Because it's a give and take, it's a drill. So be wary of those motions. 
feet. Nice. Good. One guard. Two. Oh. Time me, time me again. Two. Good. Three. Mm -hmm. Nice. Four. On proximity, style the dance. And then reverse footwork as I parry. And he parries as well. Five. Outside position. Mm -hmm. Cut. I parry. And he comes back. Nice. Again, five. Mm -hmm. Inside position. Five. Again. Six thrusts here. Nice. Again. Good. Parry. Mm -hmm. Again, six. Seven. Yeah, seven. So, if we're gonna do freestyle, it's gonna be the same principle. So if he's gonna throw me different angles without the sequence of one to seven, let's see how it plays. Any angle. Nice. Okay, at this uh, stage, what we're gonna go introduce uh, uh, the progression uh, we call crossada, which is, we call it also good team. It is like a simultaneous movement of a parry hand with a uh, slash or a cut as well. So either from open position to close position or vice versa, from close position to open position, depending on the angle. So if uh, Uri is gonna feed me one to five without the uh, uh, footwork movement, if he's feed me one, the, the crossada or the cross or the good thing will in, will will be shown as this. That is uh, the crossada. This is a good technique because it shows uh, the economy of motion. It's at the same time a parry, at the same time there is the cut. All right. So feed number one, feed number two, feed number three, feed number four. There you go. Cut. Feed number five. Always staying out of the center line of the linear direction. Okay, six. That's the six, right? Okay, we do crossada. Let me just demonstrate crossada in, in all the angles. And I will I will I will change that as we as we go to the next step. Crossada. Seven. Same. Alright. At this point, I'm gonna explain to you that there are weaknesses. Of certain techniques like for instance strike number four with a crossada you are forcing crossada here but it's not it's no longer efficient because the the weapon is close to your face so if you do this you're gonna be too late for a for an execution of the crossada so therefore in this angle it is a very weak technique because also if he's gonna do that in real time good I can't do that <laughs> I cannot do a crossada on the angle of number four at the same time, with the angle of number six, I cannot do crossada at this point or seven. The same thing. It is a weakness for this particular angle. So what we're gonna do is also, it's an adaptation of a crossada, which is, instead of this, what we're gonna do is, again, is cut, see? And parry, again. There you go. All right, so once again, when we go, number one, Number two, number three, number four, number five, sada, and number five, sada, number six, adaptation, yeah, six, seven, there you go, again, seven, okay, so going back to uh, the, uh, the give and take drills, but what we've taken so far from the first progression to the second progression, we will use the footwork now in this drill. So he feeds, and I'm gonna go reverse triangle as I parry, and he steps back too. There you go, again, once again. One guard. Number two. Number two. Number three. Again, number three. Number four. Again, number four. Five. 
Five. Now five on the inside. Five. Six. Again, six. Seven. Seven. Very good. Go to the next progression, which is what we call Sakai, which is the ride using the weapon hand as your parry hand. So if he's gonna feed me strike number one, right, this angle, I'm gonna go do a Sakai or a parry uh, ride counter. That is the way to go. And you deflect, okay? So again. Okay, strike number two. Okay, just the foundation. We'll establish the foundation of the Sakai. Strike number three. Okay, you wanna go low because he's giving you a fee that's low. Because if you don't, even if you parry, but because of the motion of the knife, it's gonna go towards your body. And that, we don't want that to happen. So in the training, you gotta go with the dynamics of proper footwork and body form. Number four, there you go. Number five, go. Number five, again going outside the, um, the line of attack. Go again. Nice. That's outside position. Inside position, I cannot use, again, it's a weakness of the Sakai for this kind of angle on the inside position because you're gonna go have the weapon move towards you, which you don't wanna happen. At this point, you're gonna use the parry hand, which is still arrived at this point. See, once again. Okay, six. Mm. Deflect, again, six. Deflect, seven. I go angle again. I go angle with the supply. All right, again. Okay, now what we're gonna do now is uh, putting some dynamics into this uh, progression. So with the Sakai, strike number one. When you do this, you gotta close the gap. All right, and make sure you follow up and check the elbow. Because if not, he's gonna go follow up and do a counter on you, and that's what we don't wanna happen. Okay, so when he does feed number one, check elbow, I close the gap, lock. See, this is my follow up. Again, lock, fall up from a different angle. Lock, fall up. Okay, done. Then strike number two, stay low, and then go follow up with the parry hand, with your live hand, here. Okay? Yeah. And then strike number three, which is a low line. You gotta stay low as well. Here. And then follow up here. Lock. Okay? So again. Four. Mm. Follow up. Okay? Your five. Check here, here. If he moves back, he wants to move back his weapon hand. If he does, go ahead. I follow with it, okay? So that's why there's the sensitivity that goes with this extreme close quarter, medium to close quarter, all right? You don't even have to see that, because you feel that energy. <clears throat> Number six, okay? Again, six, this time. Seven. Close the gap. Lock. All right. Now completing this, this the all the movements in this segment. When we are in this situation of a different angle, say number two. When you're doing the transfer of that deflection to the left hand. You know, you're vulnerable to the follow-up in here because he's gonna go 
yes, or or fall up with it with it slides on the on the neck. See here, you don't want that to happen. What we're gonna do is that when we are in this position, on all the angles on this side, when we are, this is the position that we want to be careful about. We'll do a second step, which is going back to number one, which is the same as this. Here, okay? So, completing the angles, all the follow-ups from one to seven, you'll appear this way. Up, number two, stay low, three, four, Five, six, seven. From every angle, when it's extreme close quarter you can use all the other elements of the follow-up which is which is close quarter here and this one okay two freestyle okay so that ends our progression for our Sakai the the ice pick is preferred especially when uh, the one that's gonna go engage and execute the technique or the strike on you actually would want to hide this would have, want to hide the knife at a very close range usually that's gonna be a um, ice pick position but that's also one of the simplest uh, to this to actually um, do a technique on because ice peak position the technique the, the delivery of the ice peak position he has to lift his weapon hand so which is easy on the block there you go what we're gonna do here is uh, on the drill is that when he steps I do the sayao or the dance you know, I keep the the range. There you go. That's the drill. Nice. Okay. Now I'm gonna go do the parry, which again the parry has to be correctly executed, which is the palm of the hand, not the fingers, because again with that force coming towards me, the finger cannot hold that force. It has to be a good parry on the palm. So execute. I'm. From this distance again, again, see that's the range. Okay, can also be from here to here. So, again, technique the disarm, which is a scoop. You see, that's the reverse, the knife, the edge is on the other side. Scoop, okay, scoop, and then grab the handle of the knife. All right, it will be my turn. So, from this position. He's gonna be the mirror image of me. So when I step back, when I step forward, he's gonna step back. There you go, once again, once again. So I'm gonna, this time I'll be the one to deliver the ice pick position as he block from the inside, inside using the palm of his hand and scoop. There you go. Okay, and he's turned, oh, wait. There you go, I step forward, I step back, scoop. Go this arm. My turn. Scoop, 
There you go. This does not take so much energy and the movement of the body. No. What you need to understand is you should you should have at least the foundation. And that's the triangle. The cup up triangle right there. You always maintain that. You stay low. A live hand always in place. So it is my turn now. I see defending himself with a block, parry, scoop. There you go. You can block, sometimes your block is right here. But the technique of the disarm is actually where the weapon hand is. It's not from here, because if you're gonna do this, you cannot, because he, it, it's, he's not gonna let it go. And there's no technique, it's very hard. You're gonna go struggle. So the way to go about this is when you block, even from low here, you go address that, going up, and then go scoop, scoop. See? The more he holds the weapon, the more tight he is, the more painful it is on the disarm. See? It's very easy to execute. Relax, again, it's a drill. My turn, the back. Nice. Very good. Nice. Again, this is uh, taken from Lameco drills of knife fighting. Now, we're gonna use practical application of this technique, so from this position right here. So as he steps forward, application here, scoop here, right here. Okay? And then this arm. Scoop. And then go inside. Nice. Here. Just. I'm going to show you from my side, okay? See? Right here. That's the first application. Again. Okay? Now, in reality, the moment you touch this, he's gonna be on a defensive position. He's not gonna allow me. He's either gonna grab my hand, move it towards him, and I'm gonna be in trouble because he's gonna execute a lock. So what I'm gonna do here is when he does, when he executes a uh, ice position, an ice pick position on me, I gotta go and intercept to penetrate his wall of defense. I gotta, either I hit this one or I hit this before I can do this. Execute, okay? So again, so for training, just hit the shoulder and do a follow up here, okay? Now, that is from the high line. If we're gonna go do a follow-up over here, on a low line, you cannot do this on the high line because that is not economic on your movement. That's not efficient. So what we're gonna do is adapt, adapt a movement which will address the low line. And this is the follow-up, which is very, very, actually this technique from Edgar Suliti was shared to, uh, to us by uh, one of my brothers, Bud Banan, who has this background with Silat. Here. There you go. As I should disarm, there you go. From another angle. Here. Follow up, lock, disarm. Okay. One more time before we move to the next technique. There you go. All right. The other angle is addressing that on the backhand. Because if he trusts on the ice pick position and he miss, he's gonna go follow up on the horizontal angle on my side, I have to address that. So, goes one, I move out of range and he follow ups with this backhand strike, which I have to address. And the, the movement here is that once again, one, one, two. I hit. I hit his knee. Okay? And then do the follow up. Right? And do the follow up here. Which is very painful. Painful. So you gotta take it easy. Alright, once again. Let's start from here. Here you go. Alright? This is the technique. Hit. And then do this. This position right here. Yes. 
see. Step on his right foot so he can't move. Lock, strike his neck. As you go this, as you move your hips, it's going to be painful. At the same time, you can direct that to the knife if you want to do that follow up. All right, once again, to review, we got one. Two. Okay, follow up on the second back hand. And deflect. Three. Bam. Three. Okay, there you go. Once again, on here on the back hand, there's other uh, follow ups that you can also do. Once you penetrate his defense, you stun him, you can do this, you know as a lock. That's the lock. So, from another angle. This is a choke. As you lock his weapon hand with your left. And you follow up with this. See? Tap on. Alright. Another, another technique from this angle is here. Stun here, and this is the control right here. You want to do that? <laughs> it's very hard for the others, but this is a technique. Here, this is arrest and control. There you go. Who's your daddy? <laughs> In this segment, we're going to go cover uh, the long range fighting using weaponry. And uh, the tools that we're going to be using is actually a stick. Uh, the stick, it could be a real stick or it could be a padded stick. But we have to make, uh, we have to put emphasis on this instrument being a represent representative of a real weapon. So if it's a real weapon, you, you, you cannot hold the stick or you cannot use, if it's a blade, you cannot hold the stick because it's going to cut your hands. So we have to apply certain disciplines in how we work out. So it's respecting the weapon. Even if it's padded, you don't want to be careless in the movement because that, that if we, we put that in our muscle memory, that's going to be a very, very bad habit in the movement of self-defense. So once again, this is only a representation of the real tools out there that can happen in the street. So this is a padded stick that we're going to work on. Some of the tools that we can see outside, it's on the real streets, uh, it is, is, is like a machete like this. So this is very, very dangerous. We use this sometimes in our training, but we make sure that it's a training, uh, training blade, so it's dulled. But once again, uh, we use padded sticks in our workout, and uh, we will address that in our workout today. So, on an on-guard position, you must always maintain on-guard position. Because if you are in this position, which, which is possible on, on, on sparring or fighting, but if, if you're going to go hit, if you're gonna go initiate a strike and you do this position, what you did was actually initiate a movement that is telegraphing to the opponent. So therefore, you're gonna get, uh, you know, that's not a good positioning. Because if I telegraph my move, he's gonna go counter me right away. What we need to put in our movement is that the economy of motion concept, which is very minimal move but addressing uh, you know, with, with power, with delivery of a strike in, in small moves. So what we're going to do is maintain this movement right here in this position, which is the, uh, we call it the central position, center position, because all we're going to do at this point is actually we call a, a drop or a bug sock, you know. Because if he's going to go strike, strike number one, which is hitting my temple, I can address that hitting the weapon. And also from the, from the, uh, from the uh, exercise we did a while ago, we maintained distancing. So what we did was move out at the same time striking. Once again, strike the weapon hand, defining the stick. This weapon hand, if that's the hand, you're gonna go strike and you can do a follow up. There you go, all right? If we're gonna do, a, do the same technique with strike number two, you're gonna move out of the way because if he's gonna do that for like, 100 to 130 miles per hour you are in danger you are 
in a very, very bad position. So what you want to do is protect yourself by moving away at the same time is doing a strike simultaneous. That is the principle of economy of motion. You see, it's not, it's not like this. One and two, rather, there you go. Number three, it's the same thing. Number four, number five, since he is charging, because it's a trusting motion, you move either outside position as you hit the weapon hand, or inside position. There you go. Okay, again. There you go. Now, what I did was actually a, a technique called, uh, the kind of uh, strike is called broken strike. See, so it goes back to my own guard position. You, don't, you do not work out doing this and staying in that place. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is after you initiate, you go back to your own guard position. If your own guard position is this, this is where you want to end. So therefore, strike one, okay? okay. One, two, two. Now this is just a target because you can do a follow up again, strike number one, here again, you can angle, here, alright, here, 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 alright, but simply attacking the, defying the snake first is what we want to address to add, to add up to your skill. We can also from the broken strike, you can do a flow. So as you strike one, see? And your cue here is as he motion for a strike. He lifts up, that's when you strike. You strike his hand, one more time. Okay, two, three, four, five, and five, okay? Right, so, if he's gonna go feed and doing some uh, uh, exchange, uh, a variation of a broken in the flow, this is how he's gonna go. Two. So. One. So that's the long range. We can also use the medium range, in which the medium range, this is the long range, where at this point, inspiring, you can only hit the weapon hand. When it comes to medium, this is medium range. Wherein you can apply, you can apply parry. Right? So we strike number one. Let's see. Okay, so with parry hand, okay, two, you can do a block, three, four, again, four, five, Five. Okay. The important uh, idea here is when you work up, is that you're five, and you're gonna go deflect. If it's a machete, you gotta make sure you're out of the range because he's gonna cut your leg. All right. Again, five. See here. Okay, uh, in this segment what we're going to do is uh, apply the techniques that we've used so far from the different uh, weaponry here from, from the knife with versus empty hands or knife versus knife. What we're going to, at this point, what we're going to do is empty hands versus somebody with a weaponry. You must understand that at this, uh, in this situation, he definitely has the advantage because with the weaponry, 
um, you must understand it. If you are not within the close quarter position with the one that's uh, gonna engage with a strike, you are no match for this, uh, for the assailant, you know, because he's gonna go strike you and you are within his range. You don't want that to happen. The way to look at this is that when he strikes, you either get out of the range, right? So you either get out of the range or you get in the range only after his delivery. So that's one. Here, right? So here, this one. You use follow up techniques, that's gonna hurt him so bad. Do a follow up. So, the way to address this again is let him do his strike, go out of the range, and you go inside. Make sure your approach is once it passes your center line, that is your cue, because you don't want to go too early as you're going to go hit, get hit. So, you want to go past the center line and go. So hit. There you go. And then you do a follow. So that is before. You can also go. Oh, actually, that is after. Sorry. That is after. Are we okay with that so far? We're just gonna wait edit, right? Okay. So once again, that's after. Then you go inside. And this is before. Similar to the knife, you hit his stroke or his neck and his vagus vein, and you do a disarm right after from a different angle. You go inside, right? As you disarm. Okay? Or you can also go inside. You can same, use the same principle from the knife. Here you go. Or I address and control. At this point, his weaponry is useless. There's nothing he can do about it. Okay? If he's going to go for a thrust, there you go. All right? This arm, you know. Okay. In this position right here. Yeah, back hand. Okay. Do the same. Yeah. You know? Okay. It's gonna self-defense. A good way to uh, to when you close the gap and you want to go. Um, when you want to go address the attack, you must make sure that you do not you do not catch the stick from this from that way because you're going to go you're going to go hurt yourself, especially when it's if, if it's a a, a um, impact weapon, it's going to hurt so bad. And if it's an edge or a, a blade, all the more you don't want to do that. The way to go is when he lifts, this that's your cue. That's when you come in, and you're going to go inside with your palm to stop that force as you in execute, initiate the techniques that you want to do. You address where it is, is going to make the most impact. So here, 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 or here. No? As you do with this arm. Okay? A good follow up. So if it's in this position, you don't want to catch the weapon here, right? Or you don't want to do this. It's going to hurt so bad, it might end up being broken. So what you're going to do is intercept as he lifts it, that's when you go inside. There you go. So do a follow up, and there you go. 